We hope that you found this symposium to be a meaningful way to connect with fellow cadets, other students, faculty, and staff. We especially hope that you connected with the message from the powerful speakers and discussion sessions we have enjoyed over the last two days. We would like to challenge you to carry these messages with you as you go forward, to reflect on their meaning, and to continue, and to, continue to take actions that encourage you to live honorably and to help you become a leader of character. We hope this experience challenges and inspires you to embrace the journey of development in your life and in the lives of those you lead. And now we're honored to present the Air Force Academy Character and Leadership Award. This award is presented annually at NCLS to an individual from the national or global stage who exemplifies the Academy's core values of integrity, service, and excellence, and who has demonstrated transform transformative leadership in his or her respective field. At this time, I would like to ask Lieutenant General Johnson and Mr. Ted Harms, Executive Director of Onshoots Foundation, to please come forward and present this year's Character and Leadership Award. The Academy would like to recognize and thank the Onshoots Foundation for endowing the Air Force Academy's Character and Leadership Award, thereby ensuring the continued development of exemplary character. This year's Air Force Academy Character and Leadership Award recipient is the Honorable Allison A. Hickey, Undersecretary for Benefits, Department of Veteran Affairs. Allison A. Hickey was appointed Undersecretary for Benefits in the Department of Veteran Affairs on June 6, 2011. In this position, she leads more than 20,000 employees in the Veterans Benefits Administration in the delivery of a wide range of integrated programs of non-medical benefits and service to veterans, service members, and their families and survivors. Through a nationwide network of 56 regional offices, special processing centers, and VBA headquarters, she directs the administration of VA's disability compensation pension, education and home loan guarantee, vocational rehabilitation and employment, and life insurance programs, and an annual budget of more than $94 billion. Under Secretary Hickey, Under Secretary Hickey currently leads a six-year, multi-billion dollar transformation effort at VBA to improve the quality and timeliness with which veterans' benefits are processed and delivered. Under her leadership, in less than two years, VBA has converted claim processing from a paper-bound process to a digital operating environment where claims for VA benefits services can be submitted, processed, and delivered online electronically. Prior to joining VA, Ms. Hickey led a human capital management program at Accenture for the intelligence community, where she supported operational business processes in the areas of customer relationship management, call center practices, and 21st century information technology systems. Under Secretary Hickey served 27 years in the United States Air Force on active duty in the National Guard and in the Air Force Reserves, retiring with the rank of Brigadier General as the Director of the Air Force's Future Total Force Office at the Pentagon. Ms. Hickey is a 1980 graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy, the first class with women. With this award comes the generous gift of $100,000 to be donated on behalf of Secretary Hickey to the following USAFA programs. $20,000 will go to the Academy Character Enrichment Seminar, where senior cadets focus on the ethical dilemmas and demands encountered by Air Force officers. $25,000 will go to the Diversity Fellows Program, which provides support for cadet diversity fellows to visit recognized domestic educational institutions public agencies, and centers of excellence to highlight the importance of diversity, inclusion, and cross-cultural competencies. $36,000 will go to the Human Relations Office, which offers world-class education and support in the presentation of and recovery from behaviors that inhibit the USAFA mission of producing leaders of character. $12,000 will go to the Personal Ethics and Education Representatives, which trains cadets to support their cadet peers with troubling issues 24-7 at the squadron level and refer them to, at a moment's notice, any of our helping agencies, Program Manager, Peak Performance Center, Human Relations, and the Sexual Assault Coordinator. Lastly, $7,000 will go to the Student Academic Services for the Evening Writing Tutor.
It is now my pleasure to introduce our final NCLS speaker, ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Allison A. Hickey. Well, good afternoon. Okay, now what was that noise? Don't go anywhere. What was that noise? Here's the reason I ask. When I go out and I talk to thousands of veterans all the time, I start by saying, Hua, and I get a whole bunch of Army guys that say, Hua. Okay, okay. Then I, then I look and I see all the Marines and I say, Ura, and what do they say? Ura. Okay, then I look at all my airmen friends and I say, Aim high. <laughs> okay, it, here's the challenge, y'all. The challenge is you got to find a cool, sexy word to say. <laughs> all right? All good, let's do that. Okay, but last, last, and most important, I look at all the Navy guys and say, Polly, want a cracker? <laughs> all right, so first, I, did, I made John stay here for a very specific reason. Uh, um, I, John, you think John and I don't know each other at all, and John and I really personally just met each other, uh, but what you don't know, and what I found out when I was looking at the itinerary before I came here, uh, was that, that John's name looked really familiar to me. And the reason I found out, uh, I asked my staff to go find out if there was any connection to John and anybody else that had ever gone to the academy. And I found out that John is actually uh, the son of Fred and Kathy Kunerans, both of which were in 17th Squadron, Stalag. Thank you. Uh, with me, um, and that Kathy was actually one of my roommates. And so I am honored that, uh, that John would be here today to introduce me, and I am more than honored, blessed, and humbled that his parents are both here in the audience today. And so I give you my coin to thank you for that. Thank you very thank much, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, so one of the things you're going to learn very quickly in life as you are uh, about to become the senior leaders that I know you are already uh, well-trained and well-developed in uh, is that you're really good at celebrating other people and acknowledging their contributions, but it's going to suck when it's you, okay? Because it just doesn't feel very comfortable, and that word in of itself is going to be the theme of our conversation here shortly. Uh, let me uh, just, but I will say this, I humbly, humbly uh, accept uh, this award, um, and I do it knowing that I'm really acknowledging all the great many men and women who helped shape me into who I am today, and many of them are in the room today, and I just got to tell you how blessed I feel that you were part of my life and part of the piece that makes me who I am. I, you might have noticed, and you look at my bio, you heard my bio, and you might think, yeah, those are pretty close for organizations for that stuff, that money to go to, and you'd be dead right. Um, you know, they gave me the choice to pick, and I said, let me pick something that talks to the life and experiences of Allison Hickey. And, uh, and so I couldn't have picked any four better. So use them well. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you're doing. I also want to just thank um, AOG's T. Thompson. I don't know where you're hiding out there, T, in the sea of faces. Uh, but thanks for what you do leading our AOG. And Yusafa uh, Endowment, uh, Steve Lorenz is not here. I understand he's doing something with a car because there's some gate problem that happened. But I know that General Irv Roke is, and, and, and Irv has done some fabulous things for this beloved institution that you and I get to share as part of our connection in life. I uh, also want to just thank, uh, uh, as well, uh, Dr. Drew Miller. You don't know him. I do. He's a class of 80. Uh, he's on the AOG Board of Directors. He's a research staff member at uh, the Institute for Defense Analysis, and he's the, in he's the individual I understand uh, wrote and submitted the nomination for me here, and so I just humbly thank him for what he did to put me here today. Class of 73 for doing what you do around character and leadership. So good on you. Good on you. And the center that you have developed here uh, under the leadership of Colonel Joseph uh, Sanders, uh, what a deeply meaningful mission. What a jazzy job. Could you imagine doing that, just working with people to help them figure out how to lead best and, and decide best and act best? Man, what a superb job. Uh, then I need to, uh, to thank um, uh, someone extremely special uh, in your life and mine. 
your superintendent, Lieutenant General Michelle Johnson, my dear friend, underclassmen, okay, y'all just take a moment. I could tell her to get her chin in and her shoulders back and down and drop and give me 50. The problem is she could give me 100 and not just 50. So uh, Michelle and I have shared uh, many times where we've intersected across our career. We were both National War College classmates together and certainly in the Pentagon and as colleagues as well. Uh, but what, wow, what awesome leadership you guys are blessed to have. Yeah, I agree. And there are many others I could, sh I could say thank you to. I want to acknowledge one more, um, uh, and that is a, a great airman, superb leader. We shared an intersection point too, classmate and Pentagon cellmate. And for those of you who will spend your penance in a five-sided building at some point in your career, you'll get it then, you may not now. Those of who, us who have, you have a lot of empathy for that statement, and that's uh, Lieutenant General Retired Chris Miller. So we both were in the strategic planning world, both shaping the future that you're going to go to uh, in your careers. Uh, so the Air Force Academy, boy, by the way, um, it's my home. It's my story. It's going to be yours, too. Uh, you know, it's not even just my professional life story. It's my uh, personal life story, and the audience with you today is Dr. Colonel Retired Rob Hickey, we laid eyes on one another here that, no, we did not date here. Okay, that didn't mean there wasn't bad dating going on in other ways, but we didn't date here. And my husband of 30 years, we celebrate our 30th wedding anniversary this year. Class of 1978. Thank you. Uh, he's a, he was an A-10 pilot, for those of you who love the hog. Um, he was, yeah. Uh, he was a C-130J pilot uh, as well, and he now works for the Director of National Intelligence in the Air Domain Sovereignty Intelligence Integration. I got that wrong, honey. I'm sorry. Um, uh, but, but all things intel in air and space. So he's still doing your mission as well. So, uh, so this week, right? Great time. You're on a high, right? You're energized, right? Yeah. You're very comfortable right now, right? Right? Okay, well, you're not in school, so you gotta be comfortable. There's no GR, do they still call them that, by the way? You're not doing one of those now, so you gotta be comfortable. Well, if I do my job in the next couple of minutes, well and right, you will not be comfortable. In fact, you will be very, very uncomfortable. I mean the kind of thing that I want to know, you had some queasiness coming up in your stomach, your you know, heart sort of kind of racing up into your throat or dropping to your feet. You got petty, you know, sweaty palms. You got a whole wave of self-doubt starting to creep in through your mind. Your heart rate's going a little bit higher and a little bit faster. And you'd like nothing better than to get away, run, and avoid anything that I'm saying and you want to do anything possible to make me stop. That's my mission today with you. To make you very, very uncomfortable. And why the heck would I want to do that? If you can't see discomfort in yourself, if you can't recognize it, if you can't feel it, then how are you going to ever know how to respond to it effectively? Moments that make us feel uncomfortable happen in the real world every day. And if you don't believe that, Google me and look on YouTube at a couple of hearings I've been to. They will. That was funny, by the way. <laughs> All part of the dance. So my point to you and the thing I want you to take away from today is that true leadership emerges from the moments that make us feel most uncomfortable. Think about that for just a second. True leadership emerges from the moments that make us feel most uncomfortable. Hey, if you're comfortable, you don't have to pull on anything. You don't have to dig deep. You don't have to find yourself in all this, do you? It's when you're uncomfortable that you got to find a way forward. So, story 1.1. Push through the uncomfortable feelings and do the right thing anyway, even if it gets the you know what, beat out of you. It was the fall of 1976, first class to admit women. 
I was a fourth class cadet in fourth squadron, fighting fourth. Is that what it's still called here? Yeah, there we go. Um, you know, because it was that first class of women, there was a lot of unknown, a lot of, you know, uh, just a lot of confusion, a lot of angst, a lot of everything. I'd already become tagged by that fall as someone who was being a voice for women's issues at the Air Force Academy. You know, my father used to proudly say I was his rebel with a cause, and I think if you look at everything I've done in my career, that's kind of held true about me. But at that time, speaking for women brand new to the academy didn't win me a whole lot of fame and fortune. In fact, it felt more like a scarlet letter. Nevertheless, it was the right thing to do. Female cadets at that point in time, we were, when we first show up, showed up, and we've got some wonderful female cadet classmates here with me, Gail Colvin's here also with Kathy uh, as well. But we wore uniforms that looked different than our brothers. There were these awful shirts that were left untucked. They didn't have, you know, they were different heights, different levels, uh, and we had these dumber than dog meat hats. And you can see them, by the way, in the picture, uh, pictures out there outside where you, we built that acknowledgement to mentor women who helped bring us in. Some of them are wearing those dumb hats. But anyway, we stuck out like a really sore, sloppy thumb. When we were marching, man, you could see us a mile away. We didn't look like we formed the long blue line we came here to be part of. We felt unprofessional and definitely not that good old word stract. Bottom line, I was uncomfortable that I didn't look sharp like the cadet brothers that I had with, uh, in, my, uh, in my units with me. So guess what? I spoke up. I kind of have that thing too. I found out there was an academy uniform board and that they accepted proposals to change academy uniforms. And so I was 18 and foolish. I said, what the heck? And I took them in a proposal that said, give women uniforms that have shirts that are built with tails so they can tuck them in, so they can form gig lines, put, put zippers on the front of our pants and put belt buckles on our, our pants so we can belt them up and form the gig and show the pretty belt buckle. And by the way, get rid of those dumb hats and give us wheel caps like our brothers are wearing. Um, and so, uh, so I passed it in and, you know, they thought it was kind of a good idea. So what they do, um, they send it up to higher headquarters at the Pentagon, which everything has to go to higher headquarters at the Pentagon. Don't think it ever won't in your life. And it went up to the Air Force Uniform Board. And the Air Force Uniform Board looked at it and said, you know what, this is kind of a good idea. But not just for the Air Force Academy. We should do this for the entire United States Air Force. So guess what? Six months into a duly year, I'm changing the United States Air Force for women across the nation. Wow. But here comes the uncomfortable part. It felt great. I felt just awesome for about a minute or two. About a minute or two. And then suddenly, I felt very uncomfortable for about a year or two. Here's why. I was young and naive, and I didn't understand how change makes other people very uncomfortable. Geez, for Pete's sakes, it was only clothes. What's the big deal? I was literally changing how women felt about themselves in the Air Force proudly, how they wore their uniforms and stood up straight and felt part of an organization. I had no clue at the time how men and women in the Air Force were vetted to the existing style of a couple of yards of cotton. No clue. So that change for me became a symbol of inclusion. Speaking up for change, it really mattered. But it suddenly had made me really, really unpopular with a whole group of people. And then, as a result, very, very uncomfortable once again. The uniform change was announced, and uh, then I started seeing the people who were angry. In fact, I was cornered in Mitchell Hall um, uh, by a cadet who got right up in my face and said, if I could take you behind a barn right now and beat the you-know-what out of you, I would. All because I changed how women tucked their shirts in and created a gig line. 
Or was it just that issue? No. It's never just that surface level issue. I think change made some uncomfortable and it always will. It doesn't mean that person, by the way, was bad. In fact, they weren't. They went on years later to become a person I admired immensely and loved dearly. But at that moment, their uncomfortable feelings about the chain became my problem. It'll happen to you as well. What will you do? Remember, in this instance, it was only about a shirt and a gig line. What will it mean when it's about changing Air Force visions, missions, resources, doctrine, or an operational difference you have between the way you'd employ forces and the way someone else would? And what if that other person is on the opposite side of that thought and that change from you is a well-respected airman? And you're at odds in a big way. How will you resist and react to your uncomfortable feelings? You know, would I have done anything different when I was 18 and hair on fire and all that kind of stuff uh, and, uh, and pushing forth that proposal? Probably not. I was raised in, a, in an Army family, and it taught you about grabbing uh, your character by the bootstraps and pulling it up and pushing through those uncomfortable feelings to do the right thing, even if it makes you unpopular. So my answer to you is do the right thing. Doing the right thing doesn't mean you're doing everyone a favor. Doing the right thing and doing the popular thing can be at opposite sides of the spectrum. So advice one, push through the uncomfortable feelings and do the right thing anyway, even if it gets the you-know-what beat out of you. Because after all, true leadership emerges from the moments that make us feel uncomfortable. Story 2.2. Don't listen to hecklers. Don't be a heckler. Engage in uncomfortable conversations. I remember actually standing here in the spring of 1978, literally right here on this stage. I don't think I've been back here since then. Uh, no, maybe a ring dance. There was a picture over there and standing inside big, some big monster ring. Uh, because I was one of about eight uh, third-class cadets who were finalists in the then third class speech contest. It was part of the outgrowth of our comms communication class requirement for third, third class year. I don't think they do that anymore here, do they? Uh, but I spoke, I chose to speak on a very, very uncomfortable topic at the time. Literally, it was just kind of breaking where people were starting to have a conversation, but it wasn't very conversational then. I spoke on child abuse. And unbeknownst to me, until we sort of got up to the final uh, efforts, uh, another contestant, another male classmate of mine, chose to speak on exactly the same topic. He took the position of kind of talking about it from the logos perspective, the data, the analytics, the law, the legal sort of focused. I, on the other hand, chose to speak on it from the pathos perspective, or the heart, the soul, the spirit, the human dimension and dynamic. Well, I wanted to wake up the audience, and so that's why I chose to do that. I wanted to inspire them to kind of grab in and go do and be engaged in, uh, in, in that discussion and engaged um, in the human issues that require you to invest your human feelings and passions. Children in the 1970s suffered some form of significant abuse at the rate of 10 for every 1,000 then. I wanted the audience who was sitting in the very chairs you are sitting in right now to spur to action. I wanted to make them feel uncomfortable. I still remember one of the issues and one of the stories. It was about a little girl. She was three to four years old. And she was crying and fussing, and her dad was angry and mad, and he wanted her to shut up, and she wouldn't shut up. So he took her clothes and all, and he threw her into the shower. And he doused her with water and got her soaking wet. And he th took her without drying her off, without changing her clothes, and threw her out into the frigid temperatures a lot like today and locked her out out there to punish her. Well, you can see what's going to happen here very quickly. She died. She died. 
And you know what? When I said that story, I had exactly the reaction I have in this audience today. It grew very, very quiet. It was obvious to me that people were feeling very, very uncomfortable. 19-year-old people in those days didn't handle uncomfortable well. I don't know whether you all do it better, but I think by the nature of the conversations you're choosing to engage in, you probably do. But then in the quiet, it happened. I never expected it, and I don't, can't tell you today I fully understand it. But Sonny, somebody in the audience actually heckled me. Part of me to this day wonders why anyone would laugh and heckle about something as awful as a little girl dying at the hands of her daddy's abuse, except it obviously made that young man feel very uncomfortable. Maybe, maybe, and I think about this years later as I've sort of seen the human dimension years later, maybe, maybe what I was saying he personally, his story couldn't bear to hear. And so he heckled it away so he didn't have to listen to it or feel it. Well, at the end of the day, the speech contest ended. I got fourth place. The other guy got second. And leaving the stage, one of the, uh, one of the judges came up to me and she said, you know, you had the far better argument. You had the far better approach. But you didn't win because you didn't know your audience. And that's when she said, your audience could not handle what you were saying to them. They got too uncomfortable. You will have to speak about difficult subjects as you lead people. You're going to have to push through what's going on inside of here and here and every other place where you don't want to talk about it in order to be a great leader in our beloved Air Force or in our, for those of you who are here from other places in our communities of interest. Examples of uncomfortable conversations I've experienced repeatedly over the years in leadership positions, and I will tell you, it's an everyday conversation for me today as the undersecretary. Drug, alcohol, pornography, and gambling addictions. And if you think won't happen to people sitting in this room, it will. Won't happen to my friends or my bosses, it will. Those conditions, those uncomfortable things, happen to human beings, regardless of their rank and their experiences. Mental health, depression, PTSD, disabilities. Sexual assault, domestic violence, harassment, discrimination, EEO, suicide, death, terminal illnesses, the proverbial person that walks in and tells you, I have breast, I have lung, or I have some other cancer. Bankruptcy, financial crisis, to name just a few. Those will be conversations you have to have. They will be so very uncomfortable, and you're going to have to push through them. And the hecklers amongst you and the hecklers inside you are going to want to stop you from engaging in those places. And you're going to have to push through and ignore it and ignore the things that would have you will run and avoid those conversations. Bottom line, human beings, even in uniform and after uniform, are more broken than you know right now. And you're going to have to push through and engage. So last Sunday, how many of y'all watched the Academy Awards? Anybody? Yeah, a few of y'all did. OK, so for those of you who didn't, I'm not going to talk about best picture and the best actor and all the rest of that. I'm going to talk instead about this, the, this particular uh, film. Uh, this particular film won an Oscar for Best Documentary Short, and it's called Crisis Hotline, Veterans Press One. It's a film about the struggles of returning veterans, and rather than try to caveat it, I'm going to read what it says on the back, so forgive the glasses. You will wear these too one day. Today, more military members are lost to suicide than on the battlefield. After serving their country overseas, many veterans in their darkest moments turn to the unique services of the Veterans Crisis Line to help with traumas like post-traumatic stress, depression, homelessness, 
and drug dependence. This documentary is an intimate look at the vital work of several responders who provide life-saving intervention and desperately needed referrals through the 24-hour Veterans Crisis Line. The film focuses on the intense and at times chilling calls received by the crisis line and the dedicated work of the responders and rescue coordinators who help distraught veterans. And I'm going to add this in because what you don't know is better than half of what we receive are from also anonymous currently serving service members who call this line. And these veterans, providing these veterans reasons to live. Um, this copy uh, I bought, but I bought it for you. So uh, I will give it to your folks who run your character and leadership uh, program so that you can use the opportunity to brown bag or do something, watch it together, and understand what real uncomfortable conversations look like uh, in the future and how you might help uh, engage in those. And by the way, that's why I value your peer program so much, because they do very similar functions as well. So Dana Perry, by the way, here's the phone number. And I won't expect you to memorize it. And I don't see lots of pen and paper here hiding there. But you might have cell phones if you want to type it in, in case you ever run into somebody who is, doing, is in need and demand. 1-800-273-8255. Press 1. And by the way, if you can't remember that, Google Veterans Crisis Line. It pops right to the top. And if someday this is not someone else you're going to get help for, but for you, but for you, know this. It's an anonymous line. You can call or you can chat. They have a chat function as well. But whatever you do, reach out and get help, either for someone else or for you. Your life matters too much. So um, why do I know a lot about this group? Uh, because uh, sort of since the May, June 2014 time, and I call that our VA time, which is uh, for me the dark night of the soul. It's kind of when we hit the press for the Phoenix uh, Medical Center uh, being able to get into the hospital time. Y'all know that, y'all saw it, right? By the way, it wasn't the actual health care. It was getting access in, getting an appointment to the system. And by the way, VA is nothing more than a canary in the mine on this issue. So you biology major, majors, you pre-med majors, really seriously look at primary care as a career if you want to help this nation. Because people in general, medical practitioners in general, are not signing up for primary care medical careers. They're still signing up for the specialties. No different a problem in the outside world as we saw in VA, but we are engaging the nation in now in this conversation, and I'm proud of that. Uh, anyway, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, during that period of time, we lost a beloved leader, and by the way, one of the most integritous people I have ever worked with and for and have loved. Uh, Eric Shinseki. I now have another beloved leader in Bob McDonald, uh, but at that point in time, that was a tough time for our organization, a lot of uncomfortable feelings. And uh, something else happened. I started, my, my email started going viral. Okay, so you guys get, part, get to be part of the party. It's allison.hickey at va.gov. And if you can't find that, you can Google it and get it there too. But my email went viral, and suddenly I was starting to get between 200 and 300 emails daily directly from veterans. And reading them was tough. By the way, I also will beat anybody in a thumb war because my Blackberry thumbs are really strong now. But something else happened. Between Thanksgiving and just after New Year's Day, a particularly sensitive time for suicide, I had about a dozen suicide notes directly in my email box and my email box alone. Wow, very uncomfortable conversations. What do you do when you're the one who receives that? Well, the first thing you got to do, and I had some training on this because I'd also 
earlier in my time at VA had lost an employee due to suicide, so I asked for training for my entire 20,000 workforce. And one of the things that they told me that I remembered in that instant is to be very real and very authentic and to directly ask them, are you okay? Do you plan on hurting yourself? Are you going to hurt yourself or someone else? Don't dance around it. And by the way, do not ever, ever set it aside and say they don't mean it. They're just frustrated. You can't afford to do that either. So guess who I reached out to? I'm crashing like crazy on an email here. I'm opening up another email here. I'm saying, I got this person. What do I do? How can you help me? And they engaged. And everyone that landed in my email box is alive today because of it. Yeah. And that goes to these guys. So let me tell you the rest of the story. One of these guys is a retired Air Force Master Sergeant who's answering these phone calls every day. Most of, not all, but many of these people who are answering these phone calls are you 15, 20 years from now, 10 years from now, reaching out to help a brother and sister in need, a wingman in need. So remember, the folks in Canada, Canada, I can never say this one, Canada Day, Goa, New York. Okay, remember the Veterans Crisis Line. Uh, talk about life-giving, uncomfortable conversations. And by the way, I don't know that you know this, so anytime I have an opportunity to share this with you, I will. It's not always people your age, in fact. The preponderance of that data point you hear, 22 veterans a day, is not your age category. It's your father's and your mother's age category. So you've got to keep an eye out for those uncles, those fathers, those mothers, those senior leaders who are electing that just terribly tragic outcome. All right? There are more uncomfortable conversations you will have and are having. Hasn't been a week in the last year. In fact, this morning as I'm going through all the emails trying to get a bunch done before I come talk to you, I had at least three emails in my email box from people who have suffered from military sexual trauma. One in four, and we, te we, we filter every single person that comes to every single appointment in VA asking a series of questions on military sexual trauma. One in four screen positive. That's an epidemic. It's an epidemic. But here's what I want to say to you. Thank you. Thank you as an institution for engaging in that uncomfortable conversation. Because you're making a difference here, but more than that, you're leading a national discussion about this uncomfortable situation. And you're changing things, not just here, as I saw in the press here recently, but you're changing it at every other educational institution out there of higher learning. Thank you for that. So I'm honored uh, every day to give voice to 22 million veterans today. 4.8 million, by the way, are now receiving compensation for their injuries and illnesses. 500,000 who live in abject poverty, unable to turn the lights on, have food on the table, keep the heat on on a day like this. 50,000 who are homeless, and the good part of that data is it used to be 150,000 uh, four or five years ago, and we've gotten it down to 50,000, but there ought to be nobody who's worn a uniform like yours that's worried about where they're sleeping tonight. Nobody. So we're committed to drive that down. 1.3 million who are in school using the GI Bill, that's part of what we do in my organization as well, all the education claims. Every service member separating or retiring from the military who's worried and concerned about what transition means when all I've ever known is this. I went from this at 18 through a really wonderful career, and now what? I don't know what the outside works, world looks like. I don't know. And if you think, by the way, that's just young enlisted guys leaving after a first term, it's not. It's general officers leaving, not knowing 
what to do and how to transition and the anxiety of all of that. I also tell people the number one thing I was worried about, and you all won't get this yet, maybe, but maybe some of you uh, will, is after a 27-year military career, I knew what my closet looked like, and it didn't look like anything that the outside world wore. I had, I had three different sizes of everything I wore for when I was on my skinny side and when I was on my heavy side and when I was just right. There wasn't anything that looked like a suit, and I didn't know how to do that, and I didn't know how to use the right words, and I didn't know how to lead in a collab completely collaborative environment that industry expects. But I figured it out with a lot of help and a lot of mentors. I also give voice to more than 2 million who lives in homes using their VA home loans. We do that too. And that's when you're in service, we do that for you. And 80,000 who we have kept in their home, homes just this year alone, nearly half a million we've kept in their homes avoiding foreclosure over the last five years, preventing homelessness. We've also helped unemployed disabled veterans looking for work or careers using our VA vocational rehabilitation benefits. We do that too. Many, uh, and so we do a lot of those kinds of things and I just think it's an honorable mission to have to give voice to those folks. But by the way, more than two million veterans now have served in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan over the last decade and a half. And if you look at our data, and if, by the way, you want to see the slides, they're up, uh, because we've been using them to go through hearings here last week and the week before. But for 40 years, the percent of veterans who were on the disabled rolls stayed at 8.5 percent on average. 40 years. Since 9-11, it has doubled to 19 percent. For 40 years, the average disability of our service members was 30 percent. In the last, since 2000. And one, it's exploded to 47.7%, almost 50% disabled. Why? Really good reasons. We have done so much on battlefield medicine. They're 10 times more likely to survive than all their previous cohorts were. People in World War I and II and Vietnam died. So all we were doing was paying death benefits. And now we are taking care of these people for the rest of their lives, and by the way, in 2014 is when the Vietnam veterans' claims peaked, 50 years after they served in combat. Today's veteran won't peak in terms of their claims until 2055. Vietnam veterans were filing three to four issues per claim. Today's veteran is filing 16 issues per claim which is how and why we got swamped early in this effort. So, I get to hear every day about stories that would make you cringe, and they'd make you cry, and they'd break your heart, and they'd keep you awake at night, or they'd have you trying to chase down the veteran at two in the morning because they're driving in a car and the last person they spoke to was you telling you they were going somewhere to put a gun in their head and kill themselves. Uncomfortable, right? You think you're going to have to deal with this? I want to wake you up right now so you know you will. And why do I want to do that now? Because you've got time to learn how to respond before you're there and care and the like. So. Don't let your inner heckler stop you from doing that because it feels uncomfortable. Don't listen to hecklers. Don't be a heckler. Engage in those uncomfortable conversations. Remember, true leadership emerges from the moments that make us most uncomfortable. Okay, story 3.3. Jump in with all you got, and especially if you're uncomfortable, and stay in with all you got, even if it gets much more uncomfortable. So I had some awesome jobs the latter part of my career, towards the end of my career. 
As a colonel, I uh, was asked to be the director of Air Force uh, Transformation, which is all that cool, jazzy thing you went to listen to the briefings about, what, about what's the future of the Air Force going to look like, and what am I going to get to touch and use and employ, and how am I going to operationally do that, and all the conce concepts and the technology and the organizational constructs. I got to do that, and I got to do it in depth. I got to look in 2000 and to one time frame, one, 2001, 2002, and project what the Air Force of 2020 would look like and wargame it. Laser munitions, directed energy, UAVs, all kinds of fun stuff. And guess what? 2020 is just around the corner. And a lot of the things we planned back then are coming to fruition in your Air Force that you're going to get to do. And then I transitioned and become the director, the assistant director for Air Force Strategic Planning. Got to do more of that cool stuff because in strategic planning uh, and future concepts and all the rest of that, um, you get to do all the planning and all the deep diving. And you work hard, but you don't have to execute anything. So that's somebody else's problem. You get to defend budgets and ask for the money to do it, but but other than that, someone else is stuck doing all the hard stuff. So. I got to do things like future concepts. I got to be, actually, I was the crayon holder for designing your AEF construct. With two general officers sitting around a table eating a sandwich, coloring what the AEF would look like and designing what the AEF would look like and making the posters and telling the people what it would do. Kind of cool, kind of cool. And I got to do QDRs and quadrennial defense reviews and all that big brain strategy stuff. Big, dream big dreams, think big thoughts, make big plans, all the rest. Brain candy at its best. By the way, best job on the Air Force if you ever get to do it, and Chris Miller can tell you that. But right in the middle of all that cool, on a Friday, I had my three-star boss walk into me and say, hey, Allison. Uh, and it, by the way, it was the week before they were going to release the 2005 BRAC report, Base Realignment and Closure Report, highly contentious things. So, Allison, we're going to stand up this new organization. It's got, going to be called Future Total Force. We later ended up turning it into Total Force Integration. And it's going to look at uh, the Air Force in a post-BRAC environment. We're going to identify, you're going to identify new missions and give them to people who lost their, their, their missions they're doing right now. Um, Active Guard and Reserve, they're all going to be impacted. BRAC's going to eliminate many Air Force bases and, as a result, current missions and airplanes. And, oh, by the way, we want you to run it. Okay, remember what happened to me over a shirt and a gig line? Oh, this got way, way, way more uncomfortable. So my first reaction was to do what I'm telling you not to do now, which was to run. I did not want that job. I didn't want it. I knew it was going to be a food fight. I knew I was going to be in the middle of a shooting match, and I didn't want to do it. It was going to be contentious. It was probably going to alter my career. It was going to be politically disastrous. I was hugely uncomfortable. I didn't want to say yes. It's going to happen to you, too, at some point. So I went home, and I spent some time with my uncomfortable feelings. And I don't know what it is that's going to help you get through. I will tell you, this is me personally. For me, it's talking to my spouse and talking through it, or praying. That's me personally. That's what I do. I will tell you, both of those channels were fully engaged that weekend. But then I figured it out. There was a good reason why I was asked to do that job. One, first, as you heard in the bio, I was the only one in the network of flag officers in the Pentagon at that time who had both active duty guard and reserve experience and... I was the only person with Air Force strategic planning and transformation background and understanding new missions. And I was a girl, and I think they thought if I went over with contentious plan to the, to the uh, Congress, they wouldn't hit a girl. By the way, I've subsequently learned that's absolutely not true. <laughs> so I took a deep breath. You'll have to do that, too. I jumped in. I emailed my three-star boss, and I said, I'm all in. I started Monday morning. Had to build the whole team, didn't have any team, nothing. Build the whole strategy, build the whole framework to do it, uh, and the like. It's kind of like building a jet while you're flying it. The only metric I knew at the time to tell me if I was successful is if I had everybody just a little bit, okay, I'll use this bad word because it says it better than upset. If I had everybody just a little bit pissed off, forgive me for the word, I probably had it right. I probably had it right. 
I began the largest series of concurrent mergers and acquisitions ever seen anywhere, 140 of them at the same time, worth $4 billion in the Air Force portfolio. And every single one of them was contentious. But we did things like stand up new predator missions. All 15 units that stood up that are operating right now in Iraq, Afghanistan, and everywhere else around the world came out of that effort. But by the way, tell an F-16 G pulling guy or gal, well, most of guys, because gals couldn't do it yet, uh, F-16 G pulling guy that we're going to take away your F-16 and give you a predator and you're going to fly out of a trailer with a joystick and you're going to like it. And tell me how many of them, going back to the first point, really want to take me behind a barn and do the you know what, you know, kick the you know what out of me. But we had to do the change because we had to be relevant to the war fight. We had to be relevant to the future of what this nation needed us to do. So, by the way, I also had to do the integration of active duty guard and reserve, and I was so excited to hear you all are taking that seriously here by bringing in people who have that experience and having you know and understand it, because you will be operating in an integrated way with National Guard and Reserve. If you don't know them and you don't understand them, you're going to be really, really uncomfortable. And by the way, we had to figure out how we're going to integrate these people into the same unit. They didn't want to be together, and they were constantly fighting over who was in charge. And by the way, if you're a one star in the Pentagon, you're nothing but a glorified action officer. So here I was, a one star in the Pentagon, glorified action officer. My phone was repeatedly ringing from four stars who said, Allison, you can't do that. You got to do this. And all of them had different opinions. Congress, by the way, the same. They all had different opinions. And media, by the way, the same. They all had different opinions. So today, I jokingly say that was just my apprenticeship for the job I have now. It was just a lot of, a lot of feeling uncomfortable, but at a much higher level. So it doesn't go away. But it got worse because uncomfortable became very personal. And that will happen to you too. Because somewhere in there, a two star not assigned to me in the Pentagon, not in my chain of command in the Pentagon, not even in the Pentagon, outside in the system, asked me to come see him because he wanted me to change the plan that had been well orchestrated, fought through with everybody and laid out the way it should be laid out and blood, sweat, tears, and we had a really good plan, but he wanted me to change it because I was moving his cheese. And he basically said to me, and I will not quote, but he basically said to me, and if you don't, I will make your life miserable and I will ensure that you don't stay in my Air Force and stay in the job you're in. So let me just tell you something, folks. No matter where you are in the military, private sector, nonprofit world, you never want to hear that kind of conversation because it puts you in a place where you feel like your career is in jeopardy and you feel like it's one phone call away from being over. But, you know, I kind of gotten used to by that time being in uncomfortable positions. I kind of knew what I would do as a person inside of here and how I'd react in my gut and in my brain where all those things were happening. I was getting the physical reaction to that. And I made the choice that I would make, which was the right choice. And I went up to my boss at the time and I laid out for him what had happened. I told him the story. And I had a boss who had good integrity as well. And he went to bat for me. And my legitimacy and ability was never questioned again. The plan was executed. Oh, okay, the two-star probably didn't like me and probably doesn't still today, but oh well. But I stayed in my job through that uncomfortable thing instead of walking away, and I completed my assigned mission. But let's be real honest, it doesn't always happen that way. That's not always the outcome. Sometimes the outcome is you lose. But you know what? At the end of the day, you don't lose anything if you do what's right here and right here and right here for the right reasons. You don't lose anything. You might lose the battle, but you don't lose the war. And I've been there too. You're going to be in those scenarios where you're really, really uncomfortable, so I'd advise you to do it. Talk it through with someone you trust. If you're of the kind and the inkling, pray it through. If you're the one that gets your running shoes on and runs, you know, 10 miles to stress it out through, then do that. 
I'd say uh, if you're the one to eat it through, but if you do that, then you've got to run it through. So, you know, whatever it takes. Whatever I tell you, one thing I would tell you not to do is don't drink it through. Don't addiction it through. All right? But do what you got to do to stay in the fight, especially if you know you're doing something right. This became so important to me in May of 2014 to get real personal. When suddenly across every newspaper and everything you could imagine and every TV station, you got people calling for your resignation along with a very respected secretary and a very uh, respected other group. And you're not even in the medical side of the world, but it was nice to just lump me in. It would have been easy to leave with my beloved leader. It would have been so easy. I didn't need the pain of going through that. I had already given up lots of oxygen cells and several, uh, several pieces of color in my hair, though I went to my gal on Sunday, so you can't see it. I'd known when I took this job, I was giving up oxygen cells I would never get back. But I did it anyway, because it was the right thing to do. So back to the other one, result of staying in the fight was 140 new missions that stood up for the fight in Iraq and Afghanistan, UAVs, ISR, Intel, space, integrated units, a uh, new doctrine that didn't exist, a total force approach in the Air Force is stronger than any other service, though we keep getting into those brother and sister spats, don't we? And your Air Force is better positioned for the future needs of the nation. I feel pretty doggone good about that. So point three, Story 3.3, advice, jump in with all you got, especially if you're uncomfortable, stay in with all you got, even when it gets more uncomfortable. And story four, last point. Remain unwaveringly, I got that whole word out, didn't I? Focused on both the goal and your people when things get extremely uncomfortable. You can achieve great success in great challenges if you don't get wobbly knees. So it's December of 2009. I'm out in industry. I've already made the transition. I'm speaking their language now. I'm feeling really uncomfortable. I've had three years of increasing salary. Fat, dumb, and happy. Then I get a call, December of 2009. Would you throw your name in the hat? for this undersecretary position for benefits at VA. And I'll tell you, I don't know how you decide what missions you are called to do, but I had had some things happen uh, for me. And, and I have a personal mission statement. If you've not done that, do that. I have used it for years and years and years. It's the way I grade how I'm doing in life. And the first one on my mission statement says, uh, trust that God has placed me where he has for his purpose. And that call that day came after about two or, other, two or three other things that told me, from my perspective, I was supposed to say yes. I'd be willing to do that. And so I did. Uh, by the way, I uh, uh, took up a notch or two or maybe 10,000 in terms of feeling uncomfortable. Every single person I asked and talked to said, why the heck are you going to do that job? Do you understand how broken this is? Do you understand people have tried to do this and transformed it and never succeeded before? Why are you going to do that, Alice? I said, because I'm called to do that. I mean, here are my brothers and sisters I served with. My brothers and sisters in other uniforms uh, for which I grew up as a kid with. Uh, people with PTSD, and I had a personal family member that struggled with PTSD. I saw it as no more, there's no more noble mission than doing what we were doing caring for veterans, service members, families, and survivors. I had a new industry skills. I knew what CRM was for you IT guys out in the audience studying that stuff, customer relationship management stuff, all the digital IT, you know, how do you get on multi-channels in, get people to do uh, self-service uh, um, kinds of things. I had some of that experience. It didn't, in, it didn't in the military. I had been doing work in an operational way on digital, digitization of files and dig, digital files and online claims filing. It starts to sound like they, I was supposed to do this, right? And by the way, it had all that transformation stuff. 
I also had a personal heart for the homeless. My family participated heavily in a homeless mission in our church. I'd been to the Hill and survived and knew this would require that. It's a political appointment. I've been to the media and survived too. I wanted more than anything to make it better for those here today suffering, but, though, but to make it better for you when it's time. Uh, so, the only other thing I can say is probably by this time I was addicted to uncomfortable feelings. I also knew I'd have a boss that cared that would resource it, and that's the first time in the t that that ever happened for my organization. I also knew I had an amazing team of 20,000 employees who were committed, hardworking, and by the way, 52% of them are veterans, 46% of them are direct family members of a veteran or a current serving service member. So if your spouse, when you get married, wants to work for VA, we move those people around when you move around. And by the way, the remaining 2% I call my patriots because there's nobody in my organization that doesn't care about this mission. So I chose, I jumped in, no wobbly knees. I was sworn in on the 6th of June, 2011. It's the anniversary of D-Day for you historians. I'm claiming the victory forwards forward. I was expected in 45 days to have a plan on how I would solve something that was unsolvable. Are y'all getting a little uncomfortable, at least for me, about now? I had more than a million veterans at that point in time who were filing claims for injuries they sustained in service and waiting far too long for an answer from us. We had an inventory of claims nearly 800,000 big, and it would get worse before it got better. I had a backlog of claims. That means any claim older than 125 days. It was over half a million and climbing, with the addition of more than 260,000 Agent Orange claims um, that were put into the system six months before I arrived overnight. And those would get worse before they got better. And by the way, uh, how many Vietnam veterans do I have in the audience? Uh, welcome home. Welcome home. I had a, a real, we also had just relaxed the rules for PTSD that took the, the folks on our rolls from PTSD from 47,000 to today. It's almost 800,000 on the rolls for PTSD. They couldn't claim it before because they had to prove stuff that had just too high a threshold. We had a demand for compensation claims and the six other benefit lines I do exploding for lots of the reasons I described to you earlier today. But other thing we had was eight generation of veterans at the same time in our system. How many of you know that I still, in VBA, care for the, da the daughter of a Civil War veteran? And remember, we do survivors, so the survivors of World War I veterans, the both veterans and survivors of World War II, and then everybody else after that. We had veterans coming home to an economy that was scary. So their only option to think about how do I care for my family was to file when people may not have done that otherwise. We conducted record levels of outreach to teach them about how to file and increase their awareness, including 4,400% increase in e-benefits accounts and 203% increase in outreach events. Okay, here's my challenge to you. Y'all got to do this for me, all right? Just say you will and then do it because you have integrity, all right? I've asked, by the way, whatever the vice wing commander is in West Point, I can't remember what they call him, the brigade, vice commander, brigade, whatever they call him at West Point. I went up to see them, and I asked him to make sure that everybody in there at West Point, um, every uh, plea, what did not plea, whatever they call them up there. Somebody out here knows. Uh, okay, I asked them to, uh, to make sure every single person got uh, e-benefits account and then to send me a note and when they did I'd send one out here to y'all and say hey army did it where are you and build a little inner service rivalry but guess what he didn't do it so what I want from you all is for you all to go get your e-benefits account you can do it online I heard you're all digital natives you don't got to show up to the RO even though I have the assistant director for the Denver regional office here uh, Chris Holly wave your hand Oh, uh, yeah, Army Ranger, he's back in the back. He'll be hanging around. Uh, for all you veterans in the crowd, if you've got a problem with your claim, tell Chris. 
he'll help you. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, I want you all to get your eBenefits account. You can do it with your CAT card, but I want you to take it a step further for me, a former airman and a former alum. I want you to get it with a user ID and password, because then I can count it. I can't count it when you get it with your CAC. And then I want your cadet wing commander to send me a note saying, all in, we're here. And then I'll send it to the other guys and say, they are. They did it. All right, will you do that for me? All righty, good. Do that for me, please. Here's why it matters. Because every benefit that you're going to get and do, including signing up for SGLI here in the Air Force, you're going to do on e-benefits. If you're going to buy a VA home loan, you're going to be able to get your certificate of eligibility without showing up in an office or mailing somebody a form. You're going to be doing it at 2 in the morning when you're feeding a baby. Yeah, men and women alike. When you're feeding a baby and you can't sleep and you go online on e-benefits and say, okay, I mean, I need my certificate of eligibility to get my home loan, and it's going to print out like that. No time, no wait. You're going to file any claim you file with us in the future online. You're going to upload your own medical evidence because you can. You'll know how to upload a PDF to me, and that's going to save us all kinds of time. That's been built since I arrived on June the 6th, 2011. All of that's going to flow directly into our new electronic digital processing system for which we have completely converted our organization from 5,000 tons of paper that we used to touch in a single year with little rubber fingertips on our fingers, it looks like, for those of you who need a visualization of what 5,000 tons look like, 10 Mount Everest stacked end to end, 200 Empire State Building stacked end to end. That's what we used to do in paper two years ago. And now we do it all digitally. We've scanned more than 1.3 billion images into this system. We've done more than 2 million claims in this system, and that's how yours will be done. But you've got to help me by filing online, OK? Don't send me any paper. And then you've got to help when you're getting the words out to others to help them do the same thing. But at that time, when we were dealing with 5,000 tons of paper, we were really slow. You can imagine how slow that would be to do that, right? Not very efficient and effective. But at that time, voices on the Hill were loud, stories in the press were accusatory, veterans and their families and survivors were rightfully mad. We didn't have a DOD relationship. There was a lot of accusatory fingers going back and forth, and all of that is different. Well, maybe not the Congress part, but all of that is different. I couldn't have joined this mission at a more difficult time. I walked into a two-front war, because guess what? We'd just been given the 9-11 GI Bill best, best, thing ever done on the face of the planet for veterans. But we didn't have a system and we didn't get any resources to do it, so we were sitting people around uh, meeting room tables trying to get them to cut checks, and it was a bad, bad process. It was taking way too long and student veterans were not getting the money they need to go to school, and it was a mess. We have subsequently built the airplane again while we flew it, and for those of you who study strategy, I needed to get out of a two-front war and get in and, you know, complete one, win one decisively, swing my forces the other way, and go after the second one, which was claims backlog. So we did that. We now have our education claims done, 5.5 million of them every year. They're done in five to six days. 85% of them don't touch a human hand, go through a system in a rules-based process, and are paid in a day. So we've done that as well. Yeah, that's a good one. So how do you do all that? How do you do all that while you're just daily, relentlessly uncomfortable? You remain unwaveringly focused on your people and your goal. You are unapologetic about remaining focused, laser-eyed, beady, beady laser-eyed on your people and your goal. And you don't let anything detract you from it, even people calling for your resignation. Results. I'll give you a few today. The inventory of all of our claims is down 45%. Our backlog is down 
And when I say that, what I mean is we took it from 611,000 claims or veterans claims waiting in backlog down to today it's 220,000. And we are going to get all the way down. We took in our quality had been bad. It had been about 83% accuracy. That doesn't hit bomb on target by most of you guys' standards, and it didn't by ours. We're now up over 92% in our accuracy at the claim level, almost 90, or over 96% at the medical issues inside of each claim. We fundamentally changed how we train and how we're doing that work. And we built online ways. You can go on eBenefits, see all the great stuff we've done for you to make your world better. So the last point, remain, or the last piece of advice, as I said, remain unwaveringly focused on both the goal and your people when things get uncomfortable. You can achieve great success in great challenges. No wobbly knees. Stand firm. But why? Because true leadership emerges from the moments that make us feel uncomfortable. So let me ask you a question right now. Do you feel uncomfortable yet? Yeah, thank you. That means you were listening. It doesn't, and it doesn't count, by the way, if your butt's sore because I've talked too loud, long. No, really, if you aren't just a little uncomfortable about what I've said, I mean, I'm talking very real to you right now. And by the way, that's another thing you need to do with people. You want them to get better, talk to them very real. So in summary, pay attention to your uncomfortable feelings. Embrace your uncomfortable feelings. Recognize those moments when you feel uncomfortable at the times when your leadership is being tested, formed, and matured. Sometimes under fire, but matured nonetheless. Push through the uncomfortable feelings and do the right thing anyway, even if it gets the you-know-what kicked out of you. Don't listen to hecklers and don't be a heckler. Engage in uncomfortable conversations. Jump in with all you've got and stay in with all you've got, even when it gets more uncomfortable. Remain unwaveringly focused on both the goal and your people when things get very uncomfortable. You can achieve great success and great challenges, no wobbly knees. Remember, I say it again. By the way, seven times, seven different ways, that's how you always got to say stuff. True leadership emerges from the moments that make us feel most uncomfortable. And I guarantee life will give you many, many, many uncomfortable moments to help you grow, to grow your leadership, whether you want them or not. It's your choice. Engage or run. It's your moment. See how you emerge better and stronger. So I let, read last night for the very first time the nomination that came in for, for me for this award. award. And then, frankly, I had a little few tears, misty eyes creeping up in me. And Drew had started it with a quote that I'd like to finish with you today. Dr. Martin Luther King wrote it, and he wrote that the ultimate measure of a man, he won't mind because of his thoughts that I add and woman, the ultimate measure of a man or woman is not where he or she stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he or she stands at times of challenge and controversy. The true neighbor will risk his or her position, his or her prestige, even his or her life for the welfare of others. So I thank you. God bless you. Go Air Force, be both Army and Navy. But do it uncomfortably! Secretary Hickey, thank you for that truly compelling message. It's my honor to present you this plaque on behalf of the United States Air Force Academy, the NCLS staff, and the entire cadet wing. Okay, what's that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the superintendent of the United States Air Force Academy, Lieutenant General Michelle Johnson. Just give me a couple of minutes, please. Please have a seat and just give me a couple more minutes to wrap up this great event. I can't top uh, the coin from the secretary just there, but I want to make sure we don't let uh, Cadet Conarans get away without recognizing it's no small thing to stand up in front of groups of people, 
routinely all day and all night for the last few days and to plan this for the last few months and, you, and you've really done it wonderfully well. So I just want to thank you for everybody yeah. for what you've been doing. Thank you. Way to go. Thank you. I hope you feel very proud to be part of the Long Blue Line and to see all those members that are part of the Long Blue Line and what service means after the Air Force Academy and even after the Air Force. Service is part of the Long Blue Line as well and I hope you felt the passion and the dedication that Secretary Hickey showed and the moral courage. Did you feel that? I did. So I'm getting great feedback. I, I hope that that's the case. We really want to build on this. And I want to thank the over 100 cadets and the 60 faculty and staff who've dedicated themselves to make this work in spite, of, in spite of snowstorms and ice and gates and all sorts of obstacles. I'm really grateful for all of that. Um, I, I know I've gained uh, great perspectives. It clarifies experiences I've had, and it's really brought it into focus for me, and I hope it has been for you. I repeatedly have been reminded of our culture of commitment and what we're committed to, a commitment to our profession and those core values that define us. And we, our speakers have been making it real, and I hope that's really helpful for one and all. Chief Cody talked about respect, that culture of respect so fundamental to everything we do. Admiral Howard encouraged us to show courage, physical and moral courage, and reminded us that we're on duty all the time in physical space and in social media. Rear Admiral Klein reminded us that character is harder to measure than competence, no matter what we do, and yet we need to understand it and develop it and pay attention to it. And many Academy graduates from our Academy, from others, both in and out of uniform, reminded us how they internalized the core values across a spectrum of behavior, different organizations, beyond the Air Force, beyond DOD, but also here in everything we do, in academics, athletics, uh, in the military training we do, whether we're jumping out of things or are learning things or speaking or singing or playing, whatever we do, it applies. And we're so honored to have so many distinguished scholars and thinkers among our speakers who join the conversation. We're richer for all of those contributions. We must now continue the conversation and not just pack up this afternoon and say, okay, that's done. See you until next, see you next year. That's not good enough. It's through our continued dialogue that we're going to make gains. I want to thank all the cadets and participants for encouraging this conversation by asking thoughtful questions. I don't know if Cadet Sanks is here today, but he earned a coin from Admiral Howard because he was the first to ask a question in her session. And thanks to all the other cadets who are so thoughtful and willing to stand up and express their opinions and ask great questions. I expect that we will continue these conversations so that the learning doesn't stop today. This should be a re-energizer and an inspiration for us all. And before we close, I want to emphasize that our new venue is something that shows uh, inspiration and hope for our future to continue the conversation. You've been walking past it for the last two days. If you've been able to look, look up from the ice, is our new Center for Character and Leadership Development. We, as soon as the weather breaks, we'll be able to put the rest of the glass on it and be able to hopefully cut the ribbon around September is what we're aiming to do. So next year, when you come for NCLS, it's gonna look a little different. We'll have a little different venue to share. And I know that it, because it's a new thing, it changes our skyline. It's the first major change to the skyline here for over 50 years at least. And people say, why? You know, why would we do that? Well, because it's more important than ever and because of the generosity of the Long Blue Line Many of the classes have contributed to that skylight. That's private funding. All the classes are involved. I think class of 69 may win by a nose, but so many other people from other classes have contributed to that edifice to go on top of the normal business we have, if you will, the honor code, character and leadership development classes. But that skylight represents what we all do. It's not just about honor. It's about what this whole institution, academics, athletics, our military training, or from the airfield to the sports fields, we all have a place in this, from the faculty to the coaches, to the air officers commanding, to the cadets, to outreach to the rest of the nation to be a part of this conversation. 
It aims roughly at Polaris. We know that it doesn't move, so the scientists and the engineers will correct us because it's going to move a couple of degrees. I can't really control the rotation of the Earth. But that's the idea of it. That's our moral compass. We're trying to do the right thing, and we want to reach out beyond our academy boundaries to the Air Force and to the nation and have this discussion and get it right. Because service doesn't end here. It doesn't just end in our uniform service. As you can see, the long blue line extends into civilian life, which is still service. And so it's a tremendous, it's a tremendous and exciting opportunity for us to have this. Um, the building represents our Air Force's commitment to the academy and its character and leadership mission. When the scaffolding comes down, you're going to see the skylight more clearly, and it's going to be a reminder to do the right thing when we're uncomfortable. As spectacular as it will be on the outside, it's what's inside the building that really matters. Our center will serve as a forum to enhance the quality of character and leadership dialogue and development inside the academy and outside. And it'll take time, and we'll need to help our organization grow to adjust. But that's what we're doing right now. We're at a turning point at this institution. We're 60 years young. We're ready to go to the next level, and that's where we're going to go. We've been doing this NCLS for 22 years, doing them pretty well. But now we're ready to take it to the next level. So I thank you for braving the weather to come out and join in these conversations. I thank you for your inspiration. I thank you for your support every day. But we're not done. Let's take this. Let's keep it going every day. And next year, we'll reconvene and see how far we got. Thanks to everyone. Safe travels home. Take good care of each other. Thanks for everything.